Welcome to the Dow of Digital. This is a basic introduction to the fundamentals of modern photo imaging. I'm Lee Veris, and I'll be your guide in this brief exploration of some of the very basic concepts in modern photography. We're going to look at the basics of capture technology, the nature of pixels, the basic unit of digital imagery, and how pixels create quality images, the fundamentals of resolution, and the practical implications for different types of outputs, and finally, the different image file formats and their merits for different applications. We'll start with capturing images. The photographic process works much like the human eye. The eye has a lens that collects light that passes through an adjustable iris and strikes the retina. There it is translated into electrical signals that travel through the optic nerve to the brain for processing into images that we experience. The modern digital camera replicates this process. It has a lens and an adjustable iris through which the light is collected onto a light sensitive surface. These days, the light sensitive surface that collects the image is a complementary metal oxide semiconductor or CMOS sensor. The modern digital camera has a sensor with multiple densely packed collection sites on the surface of the silicone wafer, designed to translate the light into electrical signals, which ultimately get passed on to a microprocessor, a mini computer that creates a digital image. Actually, most of the magic of the photographic imaging occurs in this computer brain. The retina, the light sensitive portion of the eye, has a very sophisticated collection of light sensitive structures called rods and cones. There are three types of cones that are sensitive to narrow bandwidths of light representing red, green, and blue color. The rods are only sensitive to brightness, are much more plentiful, and are packed in between the cones except at the very center of the retina in a, what is known as the fovea. The microscopic image here shows the dense packing of the cones in the fovea at the left and the structure of rods and cones in the other parts of the retina to the right. Notice how the cones are much larger, but actually less sensitive to light. The light-sensitive chip in a digital camera has a simpler structure with only one type of receptor. Each receptor site on the chip is covered with either a red, green, or blue filter represented here in a simple graphic. The alternating pattern of red, green, and blue receptors can be thought of as representing red, green, or blue pixels, here shown in the most popular Bayer pattern where the green alternates with red and blue such that there are twice as many green pixels as there are red or blue. The digital camera records the varying brightnesses of these red, green, and blue pixels as electrical signals of varying strength that result in each pixel receiving a numerical value in a raw file. It is important to note that these values only represent brightness at a specific pixel site on the chip. Later on, in post-processing, these values are blended together using a complex algorithm that determines the color of a particular pixel based on its initial value and color combined with its immediate neighbors. Thus, the red, green, and blue pixels are combined in an additive fashion to generate a full color image, where each pixel is assigned an RGB value, three numbers, regardless of the fact that only one value was originally recorded for each pixel on the sensor. It is important to realize that the digital cameras only record brightness values for the pixels representing the image. Color is interpreted from these brightness values, interpolating the missing data from the neighboring pixels. This requires a fair amount of complex calculation known as a demosaicing algorithm that happens in a separate stage from the actual image capture. After processing the raw data, a bitmap image is generated. This image is a collection of individual discreetly colored pixels arranged in a grid, a bitmap. The color of each pixel represents the particular blend of red, green, and blue brightness values derived from the demosaicing calculation. So after the image data is captured, it has to be processed to reinterpret the individual green, red, and blue brightness values into a full RGB color image. This process either occurs in camera, rendered as a camera JPEG, or later in some raw processing software where the user can control the processing and apply some creative enhancements. 
The goal in all of this is to end up with a collection of RGB pixels that build a high resolution image. Every modern photographic image is made from these building blocks. A pixel is simply a square unit of color. It has no inherent size value. The size of these pixels determines the quality of the image of, of detail in the image, most often represented as the resolution in the image. In the US, resolution is given as a number of pixels per inch. Now, pixels pack flush, flush next to each other, and because of this, if all the pixels are the same color, we cannot see individual pixels in the image. In fact, right now, we cannot tell if this red square is one pixel, or four, or 100. Let's assume that this square is one inch on a side. Now, if I alter the values of each pixel just enough to show them, we can see that what we have here is a grid that is 10 by 10. This is defined here as 10 pixels per inch. Sometimes you'll hear it expressed as 10 DPI, which means dots per inch. And this is a holdover from older printing press terminology and is not strictly accurate, but sometimes the two terms are used interchangeably. Because we can see individual pixels easily here, this image would be considered low res for this size. The viewing distance influences the appearance of detail, and if we move further away from the screen, at some point we will only be able to see a single red square. Now I've shrunk the red square to half its size, and the resolution now would be expressed as 20 pixels per inch. Half again, and now it's 40 pixels per inch. Half again, now 80 pixels per inch. You can see that if we take it down far enough, the individual pixels get too small to see, and that is when the image has an appropriate resolution for the output size. Here's an image whose resolution could be considered appropriate for the screen at 90 pixels per inch. At 45 pixels per inch, we see jagged edges, and we definitely have a resolution that is too low for the screen size. Half again, and we really have an image whose resolution is just way too low. We can't see any detail at all. But if we shrink that same collection of pixels down in size, we have a reasonable image, a high-res image for this size. This image is exactly the same as the previous one, but now the pixels are small enough that we are not aware of them. Sometimes people ask for a high-res image, and they then say something like, give it to me at 300 dpi. But half the information is missing. The question is, 300 dpi at what size? We need to know if it's 8 by 10 at 300 pixels per inch, or 6 by 7, or what? So, how do you know when you have enough resolution? If your image resolution matches your output resolution, typically you have enough. If your output resolution is extremely high, you may not need as much, but this is highly dependent on the type of output. The biggest determiner is whether you can see pixels at the output size. If you are aware of jaggy edges, you do not have enough, a high enough resolution. The second most important factor is whether you can see the pixels at the normal viewing distance for the output size. Typically, we stand further back when we look at larger prints, so we generally don't need as much resolution for large prints. Think about a 40-foot billboard viewed from a vehicle traveling on the highway. So here are some real-world guidelines. Magazine printing almost always calls for 300 pixels per inch. This is typical for offset lithography, which is the traditional printing press ink on paper with a 150 line screen process. Desktop inkjet, well, this is a bit looser depending on print size and paper type, but generally you can't see pixels in just about any print at 180 pixels per inch. The image may appear sharper if it's printed at a higher resolution like 240 or 360 though. These exact values are considered ideal for Epson inkjet printers printing at 2880 dots per inch, because 180, 240, and 360 divide evenly into 2880. In reality, the difference between 300 and 360 pixels per inch is basically invisible, so you don't really have to stress over this. Internet and email typically considered fine at 72 pixels per inch, even though most modern computer screens have a much higher screen resolution, upwards of 90 pixels per inch. Normally, though, images used on web pages and such are more often defined with pixel dimensions, height times width. 
the actual output size is very fluid these days because web pages may be viewed on mobile phones or 27 inch computer monitors. A 500 by 700 pixel image would display fine in Facebook at roughly 7 inches by 10 inches on the computer display, but could only be effectively printed at 3 by 4 by 6 uh, at 150 dpi, which is typically less than ideal. The actual resolution required for billboards is 18 pixels per inch. You're never close enough to the billboard to see the pixels at that res, and sending more resolution to the printer is actually counterproductive. Interestingly, if you have enough resolution in the image to print a two-page spread in a magazine, which is 11 by 17 inches, that same collection of pixels will print at billboard size. Coffee table books are usually printed at 175 line screen or higher, or use a process like stochastic screening. So very often you're asked to supply images at 350 pixels per inch. So quick review. Resolution is the density of pixels per unit of measure in the US given as pixels per inch. Pixels, those square units of color, have no inherent size. And the collection of pixels that makes up an image can be output a number of different ways at different sizes. The size and number of pixels in an image determines the quality of detail. Viewing distance also influences the appearance of detail, so larger prints need less resolution. Computer screens are considered to be fine at 72 pixels per inch, even though the typical LCD monitor has a resolution of 90 pixels per inch or more. There are a number of different types of bitmap files. The most common of these are TIFF, JPEG, and Photoshop, or PSD. And the different proprietary raw camera files, uh, collectively referred to as raw files. Let's first start with the most common file type today, the JPEG file. This file type was standardized by the Joint Photographic Experts Group, hence the JPEG acronym, in 1992. It is known as a lossy image compression format because a certain amount of image detail is thrown away or simplified in order to reduce the size of the file on disk. The amount of information lost depends on the degree of compression applied. The photographer is usually presented with a choice at the time of saving, expressed as a number, usually 1 to 10, but sometimes a percentage, with higher numbers meaning better quality and larger file sizes. The next most common file type is TIFF, or Tagged Image File Format. It's one of the oldest, most universally supported file formats. The format was originally created by the company Aldus for use in desktop publishing in 1986. When Adobe System acquired Aldus, they published version 6 of the TIFF specification in 1992, and that is basically the same version used today. The specifications for the TIFF format are flexible enough to support a number of more modern innovations like multi-res pyramid data, layers, etc. TIFF files are thought of as lossless because no matter what options are used to save it, when it is opened, it contains all of the original image fidelity. There are options available for file size compression like LZW or ZIP, but these typically don't offer as much reduction as the JPEG format. To illustrate the differences between the lossless format of TIFF and the lossy compression of JPEG, examine these three images. You will notice that even medium quality JPEGs are pretty good. Only slight artifacting can be observed at high contrast edges, and there's a very slight softening of texture. The low quality JPEG shows more severe edge artifacts and serious smoothing of textured areas. For the most part, high-quality JPEGs are visually lossless, and you can routinely use JPEG as a format for labs and printing houses who might exchange files over the internet. A special note here, the format of an image file has no bearing on the resolution of that image. Just because you save a file as a JPEG, it does not mean that that file has less resolution. Resolution is determined by the number of pixels and the size of the image output. Even though the JPEG may take up less space, it will open up to the same pixel dimensions as the lossless TIFF. Now, the quality of the reconstructed pixels may not be exactly the same, but the number of pixels will be. The other 
common file format is Photoshop or PSD. Since the most popular image editing software application on the planet is Photoshop, you are likely to encounter this format frequently. PSD is the native file format for Photoshop documents, though from a very early stage in the development of Photoshop, it supported a huge number of other image file formats. The PSD format was the second image format to support layers, and that's after painters.rif. Uh, but the Photoshop format quickly became ubiquitous as the layered file format. Now even Painter supports PSD files. These days, Photoshop will also save layered documents as TIFF files, so the existence of layers is no longer a deciding factor in whether to use .psd or not. However, since Photoshop is the only software to support layered TIFF files, and since .tif, or TIF, is universally supported in its other forms, I make it a habit to save layered files as .psd to avoid confusion later on. Finally, we have the RAW format. This is, collectively, all the different proprietary digital camera files that represent the raw luminance data captured by the camera sensor. Each camera manufacturer has a different format, like .NEF for Nikon, .CR2 for Canon, .RAF for Fuji, and so on. All of these file formats require processing in some kind of software to achieve the demosaicing required to end up with a usable bitmap image. The only way to produce an actual RAW file is to capture an image with a digital camera. Special note here, DNG is Adobe's published RAW format. DNG stands for digital negative and is an openly published specification meant to be a standard format. Though Adobe software is the only software that fully supports all of its features, and it's still owned by Adobe. Camera manufacturers do not publish the specifications for the camera files, and they do not directly support DNGs. The one thing to pay attention to here is that Photoshop supports DNG as if it was a normal image file format. This means that you are allowed to save an open document as a .dng. However, Save DNG is not an actual RAW file. It's more like a fake RAW file. So be careful here. You can convert existing RAW files into DNG without changing the character of the RAW data using either Adobe's standalone DNG converter, Adobe Camera Raw, or Lightroom. But you cannot save a real RAW file out of Photoshop. Adobe has managed to reverse engineer all of the existing camera file formats and continues to support new camera files as they become available. But except for specific professional workflow considerations, there's no special need to convert your camera raw files into DNGs. Okay, so what do we do with all these file formats? Here are some general suggestions. JPEG is basically the format you want to use when you need to reduce the saved file size. Normally, this would be any application involving the Internet. Email software often doesn't support attachments larger than 5 megs, and sometimes even less, so you need to use JPEG to email photographs. Web browsers can only display JPEGs, and file transfers over the Internet go much faster with JPEGs. Photo labs need to transfer print files over their internal network and through a RIP, RIP, or Raster Image Processor and they will routinely convert all incoming files into JPEGs anyway, so you might as well send them a high-quality JPEG rather than a TIFF. TIFF files are well supported everywhere, but universal only for flat, non-layered files, so I reserve these for delivery to ad agencies, design firms, and other professional applications. Uh, client direct PR or product photography, only because clients always ask for high-res TIFFs. I use Photoshop files for all work in progress and my master files that I archive for the future, mostly to avoid confusion with any other application for the image. So, as a review, we covered basic camera technology and image processing. We learned about how cameras capture luminance information through red, green, and blue filters, and how full color is interpolated from this luminance data with a demosaicing algorithm. We looked at the nature of pixels and how image quality is derived from having small enough pixels that we are not aware of them 
in an image viewed at an appropriate size and distance. We saw how resolution is expressed as pixel density per unit of measure, and what types of outputs required what resolutions. Finally, we went over the basic file formats used by photographers and what the merits of each were for various applications. Hopefully this presentation filled in any holes in your understanding and we can now get into more of the nitty-gritty of digital photography and imaging software. Thank you for watching. Be sure to visit my blog from time to time as I post free tutorials and I have a large archive of useful articles on my website at www.veris.com. Thanks for watching.